Hello and welcome to the first episode of our new podcast, Bombshells. I'm Flo Elizabeth. And I'm Amy Shepherd. And we're going to be interviewing some of the most influential thinkers, writers, politicians of the moment. Um, we like controversial people, people yeah. that have ideas. Anyone that interests us and hopefully interests you too. So joining us today is our first guest, needs no introduction, is book eater, Mats Goodwin. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I've done. I've done many more things with my life. You Thank you. Nice have. to be here. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for having me. Academic, and he's rolling his way into the world of politics. Mm. Every every day you're getting more influential. I'm irritating somebody you else are. every day. That's what I'm doing. At least yeah. at least five more people every day. <laughs> well, but, we're thankful for it, though. Yeah. But how are you doing? Uh, I'm okay. I'm a little bit apprehensive about where the country's going. I think probably oh. like everybody else. I'm a little bit nervous about what's going to happen at the next election with a big Labour government with a big majority. And I'm a bit nervous about our institutions, BBC and civil service legacy institutions, which mm -hmm. seem to be completely adrift from where everybody else is. Other than that, I'm great. I'm just riling people up. I'm irritating everybody on X on a daily basis. I'm really enjoying it. But do you think, do you think people are overestimating the power Labour have got at the moment? Because yeah. Because I think, um, I remember going back to the Brexit Day party in oh. Parliament Square. I was there. So was I. Were you? Yeah. Oh, I Were you there? Out. No, I was back in my living room. But we've just put the union flag up. We've got a huge union flag. that like basically covers a whole wall and had some champagne. And I have my Vote Leave t-shirt. Oh, and I did. made it my uh, Facebook profile picture. Um, and everyone was outraged. Like people were commenting, Flo, what are you doing? And I was like, proud to be a Brexit here. <laughs> Try being a Brexiteer on a university campus. Well, That's another experience. We, we'll we've both that. been that, that, that person, though. Mm. We're all three of us. No. Well, we, yeah, we I was a bit young at Brexit, so I was just a baby. <laughs> How old were you when, when the Brexit referendum happened? Um, I was 16. So the vote was the same day as my prom. Right. No, the result came out the day of my prom, and I had champagne for breakfast. But I went to a pretty Brexity school. Nice. So... Um, but anyway, I was. Yeah, I remember talking to this lady in the crowd, and she was really frustrated because she came from a red wall area, and she was like, "If it's ridiculous, if you stick a, a red rosette on a donkey, everyone will vote for it." Yeah. But I think that's different now. Yeah, definitely. I think you know. So if you look where Labour are, right? So they're twenty points ahead in the polls, so doing really, really well. But actually, if you look at what people think about the Labour Party. They don't actually like the Labour Party. So they say yeah. the Labour, Labour Party is not trustworthy, not competent, not in touch with the values of the country. They definitely don't like Keir Starmer. No. Uh, you know, his his leadership ratings are pretty weak. Um, I mean, Rishis are worse. Can I ask you, who who do you actually think Keir Starmer appeals to? Because it's beyond, it's I like think completely... He just appeals to the people that will never now vote Tory. And I think this is the thing in the country. Everybody is so... Maybe. Is so... Yeah. deeply anti-conservative because of the last 14 <clears throat> years that uh, I think Starmer is just riding on the old saying that opposition parties don't win elections, governments lose them. And I think Starmer is picking up on that. His leadership rating is plus six in the polls. Rishi's minus 25. Prince Andrew's minus 50, if you want a reference point. Uh, so it gives you a sense of where, where Sunak is <clears throat> relative to uh, uh, some really unpopular people. But I've just written on Substack, which you didn't mention in the introduction, but I'm just going to plug. I have a Substack read by over 28,000 people, including members of number 10. And what I've argued this week is Keir Starmer is probably going to be one of the most unpopular prime ministers that we've had in recent history. Mm -hmm. Liz Truss obviously being, uh, being as well very unpopular because I don't think the country really knows who he is, what he believes, what he's about, where he wants to take Britain. Yeah, he's no Tony Blair in terms of popularity. Um, and he's had... You know, people will constantly bring up the Jimmy Savile stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Beer Gate, you know. He's, Weren't you involved in Beer Gate? Um, yeah. Is we allowed to talk about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was I was involved, but um, I've managed to keep anonymous until now. Oh, well, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about sorry. that. So I, I'm happy to say I was involved, but uh, I won't say what my involvement mm. was. No, well, um, Sorry Watch the rumours fly. <laughs> well, you, you always learn something on this podcast. Yeah, maybe one day I will reveal the true story. Because uh, I would be keen to start a substack, like, 
with the way the world's going, and as you said, all the institutions are mm. rotten at the core, and with a lot of the legislation, like that your freedoms are really curtailed. So I think it's going to be harder for people with center of right, cent, right of center views to succeed in employment. So in my mind, being self-employed is the safest way and like having a sub stack clearly yeah. Yeah. one you can do what you're really passionate about like you're telling people things that you wouldn't be able to say on the BBC I say just... many of those things on my well, sub stack yeah the, you would say it on the BBC but they wouldn't want you to no and I think Matt I remember when Matt did the interview on is it was it Politics Live oh when I got cancelled on the BBC. Yeah. Well, that was basically saying the coverage of Hamas was atrocious and disgusting yeah. because they weren't referring to Hamas as what mm. they are, which is a radical, violent Islamist group. Yeah. My mum was watching that and she she was texting me like, oh my God, oh my God, I love him. I love him so much. <laughs> he was, and, and yeah. I, I actually, else was actually, I, I actually got that. lots of letters from older ladies after that interview I'm saying sure they you really did. did want to meet me for tea and coffee and, and take me for lunch. But there's a serious point about subset. I remember having this conversation with Jordan Peterson who said to me, look, if you're going to say anything countercultural, you have to have financial insulation. You yeah. have to be uncancelable, right? They, because, because people will come for you. Um, so you need to be independent of the legacy institutions. You have mm. to be outside of the BBC, the universities, whatever, you have to have your own support base and you have to be on a platform that will stand by writers who are countercultural. And the only thing I come back on you about there, Fleur, is I actually don't think it's right of centre views. I think it's just simply any views that challenge the elite consensus in this country. Yeah. So if you're sceptical of immigration, even if you're a Labour voter or, or a Conservative voter, if you're gender critical and you're on the left of politics, right, if, you're, if you question gender ideology, if you want to have strong and secure borders, if you think that actually we should protect um, traditional institutions, we should be proud of our history, all of those things put you mm. on the wrong side of the elite consensus. And that's why Substack is booming. It's why yeah. the ecosystem outside of the legacy institutions is booming. We need that to grow. We need podcasts like this. We need YouTube shows. We need Substacks. We need, you know the free speech union we need all of that stuff yeah. because it's about building an alternative yeah well i think i think the audience is there and i but i think the audience that funds this new kind of new eco, media new media yeah. this kind of like as you say all the time this kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. that we've carved out for ourselves to say we we're, we're kind of just Flora and I are hopping on the back of all of the people who have done it before us but um but the, all that, that kind of ecosystem um all of the people that that love that alternative side of media and want to hear more ideas and I and and narratives that that they understand and see themselves and reflect their own perspective I think that audience knows that as a sort of customer and an audience they actually we, we're now in a in a in a state where people are prepared to put their money where their mouth is and support things totally. and i think that's why your substack is doing so well because mm. we, we we understand that although we're asked for money and subscriptions every single day i know yeah. i think people understand that even if they are paying for the bbc license they will fork out for you and, and it is so important that people do that. I think also mm. demonstrating change <coughs> is important. So if you take an organisation like, say, the Free Speech Union, which obviously Toby, Toby Young's involved with, um, or if you look at, say, what some of the renegade academics have been doing in, in the universities, winning cases in defence of free speech, um, bringing forward new laws like the Higher Education Free Speech Act, actually showing your supporters that this isn't just a talking shop, we are delivering real world political change. When people see that, they become incredibly motivated and also courage. Yeah. Courage in politics, I know Douglas Murray, among others, has made this point and I agree with him. Um, courage is in short supply. So if you're willing to stand up and put your head above the parapet, people aren't just throwing money at you. What they're doing is they're essentially saying, you know, you're maximizing our voice within the national debate and the national conversation. And we accept that comes with enormous risks. I mean, the BBC mm. interview is a great example. Ever since yeah. doing that intervention on the BBC, I've not been invited on any BBC show since that 
intervention, including question time. Now, you've got to ask yourself, you know, why is it with somebody with 140,000 followers who's done every single show apart from question time isn't asked on? The reason is because I have countercultural views that yeah. rail against the elite consensus. But also that this, um, this whole kind of um, media alternative and, 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 our, and our kind of audiences that we um, are supporting those all those um, organizations that you've just listed um, everyone I feel like knows is becoming to realize that the law isn't the law it's really not something they can trust anymore democracy is an illusion and I I think I, I am I just think something's around the corner that's going to be very it's unpleasant it's policing yeah there's there's it, also a collapse of public trust in policing. Well, There's a collapse yeah, of public yeah, trust in, in political in, in, institutions. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I, f I feel like the law the law isn't the law. It's what one one person on a on selected on randomly on one day thinks. It, and I think we've seen that with a lot of people, especially with the free speech stuff. And um I mean people I won't go into now, but the controversial figures mm. that we can't trust authority anymore. We're running away from it. Um, and I think anyone with their head screwed on would now not go and trust institutions that they might would probably have been brought up to run to if they need help. That, that's also partly because those institutions aren't representative of most people in the country. I mean, if you look at the BBC, Parliament, police, civil service, museums, galleries, universities, if you look at all the institutions that basically make up our national conversation and steer our national conversation, they are all dominated by the same kinds of people who share the same sets of socially liberal, if not radically woke progressive values. And that actually is what I noticed this book is about, uh, Values, <laughs> Voice and Virtue by Matt Goodwin. There you Thank go. You. It's Thanks, about, you didn't it's have about, to plug yourself. It's about, I was going to do well, it. It's about how the institutions have basically become deeply disconnected from the rest of the country. I mean, I look at working class kids that come into my course at university, seminars, lectures, who want to go and work for the Times. They want to go and become uh, you know, fast track civil servant. They want to go into top levels, top level positions in, in finance, or they want to work in the creative industries. And I'm very honest with them. I say, look, unless you are coming from a privileged family background and you share the values that dominate the elite minority, it is very unlikely that you're going to get as far as you as you want to go. That's just a reality. And we need to break up, my view, controversial, but we need to break up the institutions, reform the people who are in them, make them more representative of uh, the voices that are in society. We need new political movements. We need new political parties. We need to shake up politics. Maybe that's a revolution. I don't know. Yeah. But it's certainly about but changing the zeitgeist. It's so embedded. Our political system is so embedded and formulaic. It's just... But what, there is a what, silver what lining. What would it take? What well, would it take? Well, there is a silver lining. Yes, it's embedded, but there's a silver lining. So we're speaking now in early 24. The Reform Party's just hit a record high, 16% in the polls, right? Um, we have got levels of volatility in British politics we've not had in our history, meaning that people are much more up for changing their vote. Mm -hmm. So Labour voters going Lib Dem, Lib Dem going Labour. You can definitely sense whatever. that at the moment. Yeah, and, and so if you look across Europe, you know, we've got massive elections in the spring in Europe. You look at, you know, Macron originally breaking through in France. You look at Maloney, Georgia Maloney in Italy. You look at Marine Le Pen in France. You look at Chega in Portugal. You look at Donald Trump in the US. Don't believe for a second that British politics is closed off to a new entrepreneur, to a new challenger. I mean, you know, if Nigel Farage threw his hat back in the ring, who knows what's going to happen? If somebody else threw their hat into the ring, who knows what's going to happen? Could be you. Well, There's all kinds of known unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld would say. You did mention in your recent immigration debate last week. Which that was fun. It was brilliant. It was... It was a bit too easy, though, wasn't it, to win that against Polly yeah, Toynbee and very, Aaron Bastani. Yeah. It was... Well, Aaron was interesting. Polly less so. I've never been to such a funny debate. Also, <laughs> just because it was... It's so funny listening to um, people so sure of their views, which are just stupid. Well... That debate, by the way, you can watch it online on YouTube, the big yes. immigration debate. Is that on trigonometry? Yes. You can, yeah. I think yeah. Trigger have shared it. You can yeah. also watch clips on my YouTube. Uh, so you can definitely engage with it. But what was interesting about that debate, because I helped to organise it, in two weeks we had nearly a 1,000 people at the Emmanuel Centre in Westminster mm. having a conversation, is immigration good for Britain, that they couldn't have on any other media 
show mm. or channel. I mean, this is what makes me really despairing about the state of Britain. We're not like the French and the Germans. We're incapable of having serious conversations about these issues. Everybody out there wants to talk about immigration, how mm. it's completely transforming Britain. And to be honest, how mass immigration is a complete and utter failure. It's a doomed policy experiment. It's weakening our economy. It's weakening our society. It's weakening our sense of who we are. People want to talk about it. The elite consensus, BBC and elsewhere, is kind of not allowing us to have that conversation. So that's why we had that debate. And all of a sudden, it was sold out in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it shows how keen people are to talk about it. And they wanted to vote on it at the end of the debate because, as I always say, we were never asked. Mm -hmm. It's it, This is the thing which has transformed Britain more than anything. People thought Brexit was this huge vote. People think general elections are going to change things. Immigration has changed things more than anything and we were never consulted on it. And it's affecting everyone's lives. You can't escape it. You know, you've got... It's so corrupt. Even if it was legal, it's changing things. But you've got people pretending to be Christians or pretending that they're gay, like Abdul Azidi. Yeah, that was, a, that was a horrific case. converted to Christianity. That was a horrific and case. And then had a Muslim funeral. No, no. Sure. I, right. I really yeah. believe that he... Uh... <laughs> well, the, the story of Abdul Azidi, briefly, is even more outrageous <sighs> than that. Because he applied for asylum once, was rejected. Applied twice, was rejected. Yeah. Committed a serious sexual assault. Um, was convicted of that. Then applied for asylum a third time. Then was given... Uh, asylum because a priest signed off on him being Christian and then drove down to London to pour acid mm. over a mother and two children, which is why, as I said at the debate, one stat very few people are aware of in this country, we now have the highest number of chemical attacks against women in the Western world. Um, nobody likes to talk about that. We had 720 over the last year. Why is that? Well, I can tell you it's not because people in Surrey and Hampshire are running around suddenly yeah. pouring bleach over people. Yeah. It's because we have this doomed experiment with mass immigration and we're bringing people into the country who don't share our values, don't uh, want to live by our ways of life, and to be frank, don't have much respect for uh, uh, women within the, within, the, within the society that they come from. Yeah, touching, touching back on Brexit, what, so what do you think actually happened? Because it seems to me... People came to their senses. No, no, as in like after the vote... <laughs> Well, yeah. Of course, I agree. But after the vote, because was this some kind of purposeful, willful neglect, or, or worse, was it actually like purposely scuppered? Because well, what, what, it hasn't. Yeah. We were yeah. we we knew we all knew coming out of that system was going to make us like for a short amount of time we were vulnerable because we were going to need to restructure in our own way with our own intentions and things and well, priorities. But yeah, um, but. But well, it's the people that came in afterwards, isn't well, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. There was so, a Brexit for the people and there was a Brexit for the elite. And what we got was a Brexit for the elite. Yeah. We got a Brexit yeah. that was basically delivered for liberal business Tories who wanted to put the pedal down on mass immigration because it keeps profits high, consumption high and costs low. And this is basically a Brexit for the 5%. Yeah, this is not like a Brexit for the, for the 95%. I would actually go further. I'd say Brexit's been betrayed. And I think what it's now created, the aftermath of this, is an enormous open goal for somebody or a group of people to actually stand up and have an honest conversation with the British people and say, you've been completely let down. Brexit was, the, Brexit was about redistributing <clears throat> power mm -hmm. away from London lowering migration, strengthening borders, building a genuinely independent, sovereign, self-guided nation and that was friendly to business and that was focused on generating prosperity. What we got was the total opposite of that. We got high mass uncontrolled immigration. We got a London-centric economy, still an obsession with financial services and an inability of the political mm. class to actually reshape our society around the masses. So it, it was a unique opportunity, but it's an opportunity that is being lost. And I think it was also it was it was also um, a way to get out of our morale crisis. And mm. I think because we've been betrayed and it has been hijacked by the new elite. Um, the new elite. There's a, there's, there's a wonderful book about the new elite. Who are the new elite? I hear you asking. They're they're in the pages oh, of this book. We should do take a shot every time about this um. book. <laughs> We'll too, be in too early in the afternoon for that, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, because you obviously 
Boris was basically elected on he would deliver a strong Brexit. Um, I mean, personally, I think part of the reason that he flopped a bit was he did he was seriously ill with COVID and then Carrie. Um, but you weren't you giving advice to the Conservative Party during the Boris years? I actually briefed Boris. Yeah, um, so how I did. Was that? I had a meeting with Boris. It was. Very, I mean, look, it's interesting. The first thing to say is obviously he's a very charismatic individual. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you try and hide now? <laughs> you try and sort of... That you no, I'm, I'm very him. open about it in talks. I say, if Boris had listened to me, he'd probably still be Prime Minister. Okay, so, oh, right, so he didn't listen to you. No, and he that's didn't. Why, he did the opposite. <laughs> that's why but he Boris failed was, so badly. But Boris, you know, despite doing you know his own best effort to resolve our ageing society and demographic crisis, um, <laughs> you know, he also was never a conservative. No. This is the thing about Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was a bohemian liberal. Instinctively, Boris is comfortable with migration. Instinctively, he's comfortable with what we're now living through, which to give you an idea, over the next 10 years, means another six and a half million people coming into the country. Boris basically liberalized the entire system. He, he did both, he and Dominic Cummings, by the way, uh, liberalized higher education, uh, the graduate visa route, social care, to a degree that would have made Tony Blair wince. And Tony Blair was the original architect of yeah, mass migration. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, when I briefed Boris, I was, sort of, I was sort of talking to him about, you know, who's voting for him, why people are voting for him, why he won the Red Wall, why he became the most successful leader among the working class since Margaret Thatcher, why he won an 80-seat majority. I mean, goodness, he could have gone on and transformed the country. He could have yeah. completely overturned the new Labour legislative foundation. He could have reformed the Equalities Act, the Human Rights Act. He could have been a genuinely transformative prime minister. But in the space of about 20 minutes, um, although I had to leave halfway through so he could take a phone call from Z Z Z Zelensky and then I had to come back. But anyway, in the space of about 20 <laughs> minutes, it just kind of dawned on me that he didn't really understand who was voting for him or why they were voting for him. Or he didn't care. Or maybe... Because I, I think he knew what he was doing. I think Boris's heart was in the right place. I just don't think he personally had the political compass to understand what was going on yeah, around him. Yeah. But so he didn't take your advice. Um, if you no. had advice for Rishi, what would that be? Or do you think it's too, too late? late? <laughs> well, I can say that there are people in Team Rishi, who are definitely subscribed to the Substack. So they know exactly what I think, um, which is he's got to turn the volume up massively mm. on immigration. Like, look, look, basically, here's what I would do if I was Rishi. Yeah. But this is what he won't do. I'd go to the country at the election and say, we've got to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Yes. And I'd go to the country and say, we have to do, this election is a referendum. It's a referendum on genuinely regaining, taking back control of Britain's borders which have been eroded and weakened to such an extent that we are no longer a sovereign country. If you vote for me on day one, I will leave the ECHR, I will restore control of Britain's borders, and alongside that, the experiment with mass immigration has to end. I will raise the salary thresholds even higher. <clears throat> yeah. I will change things like the social care system. I will promise to you that net migration will come back down to at least you know, below at least 200,000, 100,000, get it back to where it was before Brexit, before the Conservatives came into power in 2010. This is a really important point because mm. what people are going to say is, well, we need migration in order to keep the country going. We're an ageing society. That's bananas. That doesn't make any sense. What we're walking into is a population trap in this country. And what I mean by that is we've got such a level of population growth that's now happening in Britain. It's going to clash with the ability of the state to absorb that degree of population growth. That's why the NHS is going to collapse. That's why public services are deteriorating. It's why we can't solve the housing crisis. Rishi has a unique opportunity, if he actually had courage, and pardon my expression, balls, to actually come out and say to the British people, I'm the only one who will level with you on this issue. Now, he won't do that because I know the people around him and they won't do that, yeah. which means ultimately, Fleur, what we need is a new political movement in this country that is much more in tune with where mm. voters are on these issues. Now, that might be reform, or it could be reform with some other things that have broadened out the package. I don't mm. think reform are quite there yet. I don't think they've so, quite so cut you, through. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't stand with reform? I'm seriously reflecting on <laughs> what might happen after the next general election. But I've got a, I've yeah. got a two-step process. The first step, and I've actually talked with people about this. The first step in this process is the Conservative Party defeat. 
how big is this defeat going to be? So if the Conservatives slump to the polls this morning, got them on 19%, 20%, well, let's be generous. Let's say they fall to 25 26%, 27%, maybe 30%. But let's say the defeat is comprehensive. 1997-style defeat, an extinction-level type event. Then I think in the aftermath of that, what the Tories will do, because mainly they're not very clever, is they'll move back to the centre. They'll do a David Cameron 2.0. They'll elect a Penny Morden. They'll say the future is, is social liberalism. That's the moment an enormous opportunity opens up in British politics for something else. And you can see it. That's mm. why reform are on, you know, 16% today, without really saying anything, without having any, you know, without Nigel Farage and so on. So the appetite yeah. is going to be enormous. So in answer to your question, what comes after the general election is going to be much more interesting than what happens before the general election. Can I ask, say, we assume <clears throat> that everything works out as we would like with new party, new mm. movement, new political structure so we get all that in place we get what we want tick 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 then where are we going what's it like what does it look like can i butt in with something that mark said in the debate you said potential if it's necessary a freeze mm. on immigration a five-year moratorium yeah yeah i am all for that i think a lot of people would be all for that yeah I think people can sense radical, that but... things are completely out of control. Yeah. The other potential possibility is we we have another national referendum on reducing net migration to a hun no more than 100,000 a year. And we just say, actually, what we're going to do is rebuild this policy in a radical way. Look, to put it bluntly, there's now a conservative case for rejoining the European Union. Mm. I would never do it, but let me just play it yeah. out for a second because on the migration issue, what mm -hmm. at least you... You, you might get then is is lower rates of migration, but also migration from countries that have similar values, similar ways of life. What we are experiencing mm -hmm. is going to be what we're going to see over the next ten years is nothing like what we've seen over the last ten or twenty years. No. You know, as we're mm -hmm. talking today, the stats have just come out. We had seven and a half percent population growth over the last ten years, which is the sharpest growth we've ever had in our history. Um, we are going to have ten percent population growth over the next. 10 years. And that's mainly going to come from Nigeria, India, Pakistan, places like Afghanistan, you know, small boats, etc. And we ain't seen nothing yet. Mm. <laughs> but what else? So, so, but what, what does the ideal country, if we're, are we going back to something? Are we going forward no, we're with moving something? Forward. We're moving forward to become a self-governing, independent nation with strong and secure borders where we can protect British people and we prioritise British people and everything from the economy to housing to the National Health Service. That is what we want to move forward to. We want to honour the promise of what the last 10 years was supposed to be about. And we want to put power back in the hands of the people and their communities. We want a redistribution of political, economic and cultural power back to the people, right? We want the principle of popular sovereignty embedded at the heart of our system because experts and elites have shown themselves mm. incapable of running the country in the interests of the British people. It's a very simple um, principle that runs through the heart of that movement, which is I have more faith in the British people than I do in the expert class and the elite class. That, that's the foundational principle. And the British people consistently have been right. They've been right to be suspicious of, you know, forever wars in Iraq yeah. and Afghanistan um, and Syria. They were right to be suspicious of the lockdowns. They were right to be suspicious of mass migration. They're right to be suspicious of the civil service and the politicization of our institutions. You know, they are the, the wisdom of crowds is, is, is enormously powerful. Um, and that's what I would like to see. And it that's is, what we don't it's, have. So it's rather the crowd that's just been ignored and like kind of redacted. Mm. From not just ignored, actually, sneered at and yeah, stigmatized. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, I've obviously changed my views over the last 10 years, and I'll give you one reason why. It was witnessing the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, mm. coming from a pretty working class, normal community with lots of people in my world that voted for Brexit. You know, what I saw among the elite class, which I had joined by becoming a university professor in the years after Brexit, was nothing short of sickening the way in which they talked about their fellow citizens, they mm -hmm. looked down upon their fellow citizens, the gammons, the bigots, mm. the racists, was God, absolutely makes, outrageous. Yeah. She called her constituents idiots. 
Yeah, not remember, only that, remember Holly she, Toynbee at the no, immigration debate. I was going to remind her. She wrote a lovely piece saying, "Well, the Brexit Brexit voters will all die soon." I'm I sorry. know. She. It's this. Can I just say something about Polly Toynbee? This might Go be on. <laughs> a bit mean, oh, yeah. but she just ignites something in me. So, for someone who was Tell us so, more about that. for someone who was so deaf that the moderator had to move and sit right next to her and whisper the questions in her ear. Polly is clearly not of an age where she's going to be living through the effects of mass immigration. So I don't think she should be allowed an opinion on it. It's well, it's our generation and our children and our grandchildren. That's the, that if re- this carries the remain on, argument though, Fleur. <laughs> One what, thing for, the, ag- that they used against Brexiteers. Yeah, but Brexit, as I said, doesn't change your life in the way that mass immigration does. I would, one thing I would say, which I also talk about in um, the Substack in my book, is about the luxury belief class. And yeah. I do think Polly Toynbee is a nice example of that. The luxury She's, belief yeah, class she is the are incredibly example. privileged, financially affluent people Nepotism. that advocate mm-hmm. beliefs that bring them low costs but impose oh, enormous costs on other people. Mass migration yeah. is one. Of course, I, I see this in the universities all the time. Most mm-hmm. people think, when they, when they think of immigration in the universities, they think about the very talented Indian uh, scientist, PhD student who's at Oxford, who's you know issuing and patents and changing the world and making millions of dollars, right? That's what <clears> they think, right? They think about their PhD students when they think about migration. They're not thinking about the delivery drivers in you know oh, uh, no. Tower Hamlets. They're no, thinking no, no. about actually migration within the context of the elite class. Yeah. So they advocate because they don't come beliefs. into contact with them. But it's it's so funny. I think I think that the British working class are the are like neglected again 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 no matter what it's all like and and with the new elite you, they they basically are put at a disadvantage by all of the kind of um categories of ideology that that come with the, with the new elite yeah um so sneering about brexit um immigration mass immigration even things like the equalities act because if you've got the gen um um the gender recognition act yeah it's not going to be the the luxury classes having to deal with their their the mum who is who can't look after herself and she she wants a female nurse to come and look after and she can't guarantee that anymore or so she's got English nothing nurse. else that speaks yeah that's english me. but also um yeah. but 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 the issue too is is that if you look at where voters are on a lot of these issues let's say you know renaming um, mothers, pregnant persons, or let's say the Scotland legislation attempting to allow 16-year-olds to change their gender without medical supervision. None of these policies are actually popular. They're, they're represented by 15% of the country, the kind of radically woke progressive elite who dominate the institutions. So if you're willing to challenge that group and you're financially insulated and you don't give a F about the consequences, you can have enormous cut through. That's what we've seen. I mean, if you look, for example, at, you know, the latest ruling on um, uh, puberty blockers, Mm -hmm. right? Okay, that's an ongoing issue. The NHS are trying to get around it. But puberty blockers being essentially taken off NHS England. I mean, I did a piece on that. And when you look at the lack of evidence for puberty blockers, what I would consider to be child abuse, Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the lack of evidence and the extent to which the expert class were willing to go along with that because it matched with their luxury beliefs, it was really outrageous. But when you call call it out, you know, Labour rolling back from gender self-ID, Scotland using, uh, the SNP losing the uh, gender debate uh, around uh, 16-year-olds. When you look at the free speech issue, what I'm trying to say is don't fall into the Peter Hitchens trap of thinking the game is up. Don't fall into the trap of thinking we should all just move to Italy, however tempting that that currently is. Um, Victories are happening. The pushback is happening. Mm. But for Gen Z, Zoomers, your generation, it means you have to actually mobilise and do something about it. Yeah. We need to bring back a little bit of pride, bring back a little bit of shame, actually quite a lot of shame. We need a lot of shame back in society now to take us back. Confirm what kind of pride you mean. (laughs) (laughs) Um, As in picking up our litter. National pride. For instance. Not Mm -hmm. not, not pride, man. Not pride as in... (laughs) LGBT, which we all know actually means T, but um, <laughs> she's getting um, turfy. I'm getting turfy. <laughs> um, yeah, no. 
I'm deliberately not saying anything because I'm I know trying you're, not to be cancelled. You're doing you're, do, you're <laughs> yeah. doing that thing where you just basically shut up and make, hmm. prompt the other person to talk more and dig their own grave. But Thanks, I think definitely. Matt. But this this is only the beginning of what we're going to see, which is a, de- a deterioration of the shared values, mm. customs, and traditions mm-hmm. that, that hold us together. I mean, the example being, if you look at the, uh, we just had a report that's come out on the school teacher in Batley who yes. is still in hiding because he showed a, an image of the uh, of of Muhammad in uh, in class and was then basically intimidated and harassed by by Muslim activists. Um, I see. I read horrific cases like that and how that that teacher was let down by the police and the council and the the report by Sarah Khan really doesn't pull any punches I mean he this teacher was really badly let down so and by Um, the unions but so I I I compare that case with then our national um commentators who say multiculturalism is a a Mm. success we have nothing to see here there are no problems where I think in reality what those cases are telling us like the Michaela school where again Mm. Um, local Muslims pressuring the school into allowing uh, religious ceremonies and and prayer into a school that deliberately doesn't have prayer Mm -hmm. so it can unite children together. Um, This is the beginning of an ongoing top-down intimidation of institutions, which will only become more visible as we go, as the increase, as we see a sharp increase in the share of Britain's population that is Muslim, but also in terms of the overall demographic changes that we're going to see over the next 20 years. So what we need is a strong pushback now to establish what we want to protect. Yeah. And what we want. So if you are watching or listening to the free version of Bombshells, then we've sadly come to the end. However, if you want to become a premium subscriber for as little as £5 a month, then visit basedmedia.org and sign up. You can also... Get a Zoom call with Amy and I once a month where you can ask us any questions if you get the silver membership, which is £10 a month. Thank you for listening.